Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Dang it. I've done it again. I've wrapped my headphones around the pop filter. So <clears throat> we're back again, and uh, we've got for you our own panel today. Uh, this Te- is technically Abby's. Oh, well, yeah, it was Abby who was in charge of the panel. I say our own panel because it's the panel we were on. The panel we rocked like a hurricane. That's right. Yeah, so our panel was called Using Comedy to Humanize Characters and Hook Listeners. Yes, that's what it is. Um, yeah, ours was about comedy, how to use comedy to uh, to make it pop. <laughs> So uh, who was on our panel, sir? Our panel included uh, the two of us, Rich Outfield, Big Anklevich. Then there was also Abigail Hilton, who we've already mentioned, who was the moderator of the panel, who was kind of running it. And also along with us was L. Scribe Harris, who you've heard on various episodes of the Doonstief, and she runs her own, I don't say she runs her own, but she's part of her own podcast over at the Pendragon variety show one of those female podcasts two of those female podcasts i guess since we're talking about uh, abby being on the panel as well two of the 12.5 percent wait but you remember when we first started how difficult it was to find female voices we knew no one you would have to wrangle family members co-workers the homeless just that one time and then now i you know it's been this great boon to discover all these female podcasters that are passionate and talented and most importantly female yeah way back when what was it i think it was episode two i had the actual janitor at the place that i work play the janitor on the story that we had (laughs) See, that's that was where look at where we were and where how far we've come. You, you've come a long way, Virginia Slim. What? Um, I eh? I guess we'll just let the panel play. But uh, this was one where I was nervous beforehand because I had never been on the panel before. But I had sat in many many panels, not just you know for entertaining things, but for motivation for writing conferences things like that and i and there had been times when you and i had been at panels or i told you about panels that were really weak and it was like i, I could be up there i i want i could do that this is the someday i want to do someday i'm going to be, be up on there. a weak panel but then i could be the weak link of a weak panel that's the thing that was my fear before <laughs> it started i started to think well what made those panels that i saw weak and maybe I'm going to bring that to the table. You know, what am I doing? I, I should pretend I should feign death. So Abby will take me off the panel. Um, and so we'll I tried that in the middle of the panel. Just listen. If you listen close, you can hear the thump as his head hits the table, but nobody bought it. So we just gave up and went back to pretending to be alive. This is true. <laughs> But I I just was going to invite the listener to uh, enjoy the panel and decide whether, you know, it was a weak one or not. The subject was comedy. And so hopefully if we made the audience laugh, then we were halfway successful. Okay. Halfway? See the math thing again. (laughs) All right. Enjoy it, folks. Be right back. and I uh, have the Build the Power Catchers podcast. I uh, do full cast audio, so I have voice actors and sound effects, and some of my characters are funny. Here I have uh, panelists, Lauren Scrat Harris, and uh, Rich Outfield, and Big Anklevich, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and we'll go from there. Hi, I'm Lauren Harris. Uh, I go by Scribe on the Pendragon Variety Podcast, which is an audio literary magazine and roundtable discussion podcast geared toward writers of genre fiction. And um, I have done a, um, a small, modest amount of voice acting for a variety of podcast fiction, short fiction works and novels. You're first, sir. I'm Rich Outfield. Together, excuse me. Together, we do the Dunstief Audio Fiction Magazine, which is a. It's on. The attack has begun. (laughs) It is a fiction podcast where we produce stories with a full cast, uh, children doing children voices. 
women doing women voices and, uh, and sound effects and music. And we are the hosts, and we do banter. We have a podcast called That Gets My Goat. And uh, is that all we need to say? Or is, as far as comedy goes, when I was in eighth grade, I was bullied by this guy. We'll call him Dan, because his name was Dan. And he, he would terrorize me. And one day, he heard me do the voice of Snuggle the Fabric Softener Bear. Does anybody remember him? <clears throat> it, it goes something like, I am a snuggle, snuggly fabric softener that's really less expensive. And of course, this was pre-puberty, so it was way up there and way cuter. And, and for some reason, he thought this was funny. And instead of you know, beating me up or threatening to beat me up, he would grab me and drag me in front of his scumbag friends and say, do it, do, do the voice of the bear. And so, you know, it protected me. And it's like, wow, I have a, a, a shell that, of comedy or of a funny voice or whatever. And now he left me alone. Hi, I'm Dan. Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm Big Anklevich. I'm the uh, co-host to uh, the Doomsday Audio Fiction Magazine with Rich Outfield here. And yeah, I do basically the same thing as he does because he introduced our show. Uh, we do the stories, um, full cast style, and uh, yeah, the banter section, which is a kind of, I think a little different than most shows, we'll go on and on talking about the story, about things that we're interested in, and it gives us a, another opportunity to add comedy into our show, is uh, when we just talk afterwards. Kind of like, you know, everybody has a good time with their friends when they sit around and are just joking about this and that. We add that on to the end of the story, so that's our, our, our shtick. So you can see who we are up here. You can see uh, the addresses of our podcast. I have got some audio clips for you to listen to, but I didn't bring a whole slide presentation. So you, you got our contact up there. You've got plenty of time to write it down, and otherwise you're going to have to look at our faces. So I'm so sorry. Um, one, uh, one caveat, the, all of our podcasts have an explicit rating in iTunes. We don't curse a lot, but they're not really intended for children. So uh, we're going to try to keep it clean as far as cursing goes, but I can't promise you there will be no adult humor because we, we create products for, for grown-ups. So leave now if you have all the small children, please take them out. <laughs> First, uh, the first question. Yeah, you in the back with the small children. <laughs> you in the back. Yeah. Please. Uh, the please. Invisible family. The invisible family. Please leave. Your little dog too. Um, so the first, uh, the first question I have for my panelists, uh, from Garfield the cat to James Harriet to Jack Sparrow, humorous characters often resonate strongly with audiences. What are? <laughs> he disagrees. <laughs> Oh. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, what are some humorous characters that you have created, and how did the audiences respond to them? Lauren goes first, and I actually have a clip from Lauren to play of uh, promos that she did for her podcast. I think this is a good place to play it. Do you agree? Yeah. Um, now, I actually have not released any of my personal fiction that I've created as a podcast as of yet, so um, I will actually defer to the promos that we have created for the podcast um, and the reason we created the promos the way we did was because um, we are a roundtable discussion podcast predominantly. So we wanted to reach out and let people know, hey, yeah, we do discuss things that will help you as a genre fiction writer, um, or we think the things that have helped us. But we're also pretty hilarious because, like Big and Rish said, we're a group of friends getting together and discussing things. There's going to be a lot of jokes. So we decided to reach out and try to snare an audience using humor. You know how I like it when you talk about your fantasies and your science fictions on the Pendrag Variety Podcast. www.pendragonvariety.com We'll be waiting. <laughs> and another one. Hey, baby. You know you want me to push the right button. And that button is the one that turns you on to the Pendragon Variety Podcast. I 
and I've got one more. Part of the point of this is that characters that you create are not necessarily fiction characters. Uh, it may shock you to learn that Big Anklevish and Rich Outfield are not these guys' real names. So sometimes <laughs> characters that you create what? are personas, um, either for promos like this or for your own podcast. Uh, they don't they don't have to be fiction characters. And here's your last one. Tonight's a night, girl. I'm gonna dress up like a barbarian lord, and you're gonna put on those elf ears I like so much. And we're gonna listen to the Pin Dragon Variety Podcast. And it might also shock you to know that the the, the male voice that was me. Really? <laughs> yeah. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't recognize her because she worked really hard on that. I did. Um, so, Big and Rich, what about your characters that you've created, both in uh, for stories and for your own personas on your podcast? Well, yes, she spilled the beans that we we actually play characters. We're playing characters right now. I'm much handsomer in real life. We. But just because uh, you know, I grew up. I listened to the radio, and there were people that you would look forward to their shows because they'd have th- funny things to say, or, or they liked the kind of music that you said, or they, you know, they were professional or unprofessional, or whatever you responded to, and you felt like you knew them. And then they'd have a remote, and you'd go, and that face wouldn't match the the voice and, and all that. But but you have a freedom to create who you are, especially when we have our our own forum where we can talk as much as we want and. And I just, I've always found that making fun of yourself is the first step in getting other people not to make fun of you. And so that's something that's huge in my character and me and me is I'm always going to mock myself first before you do. And, and, and that, I, I mean, I hope it endears people. Maybe it frustrates some people, but if it makes them laugh, then. You know, On the I'm, podcast, Rish has a very self effacing always always doing the wrong thing, always in the wrong, never getting the girl. You know, that's kind of the personality he plays on the podcast. Um, in real life, he's a pimp with, you know, 20 women. But <laughs> Vic, how about you? Um, yeah, it, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, let me read the question real quick so I make sure I'm not straying forward when, into When further. you have created humorous characters or humorous personas, how have you gone about it, and how have you found the audiences respond to it? Okay, uh, I, I think it really helps to, uh, I mean, the, the humor for the characters, they will respond to them more than anything. I'm really a dull and uninteresting guy in general, <laughs> but uh, adding in some humor, at least sitting next to Rich so that, you know, I, I'm close to the humor, um, helps you know, these people listen to our show, they come back week after week, and they've gotten to the point where they, like us, uh, you know, and they're not just there for, oh, I like hearing the stories you guys do. Um, there are people who have said that they'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the story when I have time, uh, but I'm gonna fast forward past the story and just listen to what you guys had to say, because I enjoy that part even more. Um, so it can really, hook listeners as we said in our yeah. little tagline and you know get people to want to come back again and again just for your show and i started listening to their podcast when i, I didn't know them at all i was in anesthesia school i was very very busy and um i would listen to a little bit of the after talk the after chatter and then i would be like this is kind of weird i don't know these people and then i would just you know skip it because they would have a story in front of it and then, like, each week I'd listen to a little bit more, a little bit more, and it's the humor that made me feel like, oh, these are real people, these are people that I want to connect with. Um, I want to come back and hear this again. Uh, for my, my story, my novel, um, I have several characters that are funny, but I have one particular character named Silvio who's, who's quite funny and sarcastic and bitter and mean. And people love this character, and I've had uh, fans turn up at cons with, like, dolls made of this character, and... Um, artwork and fan art and like it, it really it's surprising how people how hard people go up onto a funny character as opposed to, to other kinds of characters um, so my next question is uh, humor is subjective and it's never universal as for the woman who just walked out the door uh, what elements do you find <laughs> <laughs> sorry we're not funny um, actually we're trying to tell you how to be funny we will eventually get to kind of like the nuts and bolts of it what elements do you find that most listeners respond to and I am actually going to go first on that one 
uh, the humor in my stories is pretty situational. So I'm not going to play you a clip from one of my stories because you would have had to kind of listen to the whole book to understand why those clips were funny. But I will tell you one thing that has worked really well for me. I save outtakes. So anytime somebody... Uh, especially like a really sweet character, flubs a line, curses a blue streak, and then you know returns to doing their lines for me, because they all send me their voice acting work. Um, I clip that out and I stick it in a file and then I play them all back to back at the end. People love that stuff. People, I'm not gonna say they'll listen to the whole book just to hear the outtakes, but it, for many people, it is almost like their favorite episode. So outtakes work really, really well. Uh, the, 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 it's Just messing up your line isn't funny. So you sort of have to, um, you have to let your voice actors know that it's okay to maybe make fun of a line if they think it's funny and then return and give you a good take. But if you let your voice actors play a little bit um, and then you lift those out and put them in outtakes, uh, that works really, really well for making people laugh and making people laugh uh, bonds them to you. That, Lauren, can I say something real go quick? Go ahead, yeah. yeah we don't have to talk in order. I was just going to say that's uh, something that's worked well for our show too is we've pretty much stuck an outtake from every show at the very end, the very, very, very last thing after the music is finished playing and everything as maybe an incentive to try and get people to actually listen beyond the story and mm -hmm. listen all the way to the end so they can hear that one thing. And I think that might uh, help as well, have helped to get people to stick around long enough to get hooked, if you know what I mean. Right. We do the same thing on Pendragon Variety when we um, have some... We often have tangents that we go on in the middle, but there's something funny in it. If it doesn't fit with the actual discussion, I'll clip it out, and then I'll oftentimes put that at the end after the music. But uh, in, in terms of the, the question you asked, um, another thing that I've noticed... Um, besides the talk the, fast, the apocalypse is coming. The apocalypse is coming, so we have to finish. Sorry, <laughs> I'll make my point quickly. Um, no, I won't. But the uh, I've noticed a lot of times people will hold on, especially in genre fiction where you have to have a lot of exposition and setting up of the world at the beginning of stories. Oftentimes, there's a lot of explaining you have to do, and there's only so much explaining that people will stick around for, but I find they'll stick around longer if you have some kind of break in that explanation and you make it funny. Yeah, um, and if yeah. the, the more humor is there at the very beginning, it's an easy way to hook readers and to keep them on longer than they may have if you just read it straight through or without the humor. Yeah, exactly what Big and Rich are talking about, kind of like the, the bait at the end of the sort of piece of vegetable that they must swallow is, is that little laugh. And if they, if they know it's coming, it will, it will keep them listening through. I've listened to several podcasts that had uh, fake advertisements. In fact, the Dune Steve guys ran one recently. Um, the, they were asking you to donate to the fund for gamma radiation poisoning, and they had fake Hulk um, give this long, teary commercial for gamma radiation poisoning. Listening. Um, it was hilarious, and I'm sure, I think it probably made people donate. Might have. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty darn funny, and I've had, I've listened to some other podcasts. Uh, James Durham's Fetidus had, this is also a novel, a full cast novel, had, had gobs and gobs of these, these little um, fake advertisements that were extremely funny, and even when the story was dragging a little bit, you'd keep listening to get to that fake <laughs> advertisement. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to say... Um, I was listening to a podcast interview with Tucker Max recently, a comedian known for his insensitivity. He said something interesting. Humor always comes from pain. That made, me, uh, that made sense to me. The funniest characters that I have created have backgrounds of significant trauma. Humor is a coping mechanism, as for poor Rish and the bully Dan, who later became his podcasting buddy. Uh, and when... Readers or listeners recognize that the humorous character becomes more real. They become more human. Um, people think of humor as shallow, but humor actually handled correctly doesn't make characters shallow. It m gives them depth because humor often does is a coping mechanism for pain. Uh, have you found that humor and pain often go side by side in your characters, uh, or how have you uh, found that humor can can humor humanize characters that might otherwise be shallow or uninteresting or emo right so characters for example um let's let's take the the kicking horse of twilight 
and look at the main character, Bella. When she comes onto the scene, there's no point at which she um, makes fun of herself or says anything funny. And so I didn't actually find her very interesting. There was a lot of whining and a lot of complaining. And I think she would have felt a lot more three-dimensional and human to me had she been able to be funny. And um, a lot of times what I hear, um, my, my roommate is a teen librarian, and uh, one of the major complaints that the teens have when they're reading fiction is the character's whiny. The character, they, they whine too much. And I'm like, their sister just died. Yeah, they're whiny. So a lot of times if you can't insert some kind of humor, some kind of levity to give that a contrast and uh, to sort of juxtapose the, the pain against the, the levity, then it's... It's unbearable. It's yeah. unbearable. Sometimes it's it's like Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> so, Big and Rich, what have you what have you found? Um, you found that pain and well, uh, humor go side by side. Pain and humor definitely go side by side. I mean, like uh, how many thousands of YouTube videos and. Uh, you know, funniest home video clips are somebody getting hit right in the nuts with something. I mean, it's <laughs> hilarious stuff. Wow. Uh, <laughs> in slapstick humor, that's the entirety of slapstick humor. <laughs> yeah, that's true. slap is right there. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, beyond that, though, as far as humanizing characters and, and, and the like, um, this is something that Rich does a lot. Uh, he likes to write characters that are kind of similar to that guy that he was that was bullied when he was younger um the the person that's the outsider that has a lot of problems kind of a thing and the same kind of mechanism uh, that he used to cope is what this character does to be likable he's a funny he's wisecracking he's he's got that uh, side to him which helps to make him more likable and helps to make him uh, more interesting and worth reading about instead of going because eh. I actually had this problem once when I was writing a story I wrote this story about a really nerdy guy and the problems that he was having and then I, I showed my wife the first few pages of the story she read it and she's like eh, I don't really like your character he's, he's too nerdy and <laughs> I was just like, oh, oh, great. And so I had to redo the whole thing, which I lost steam and never did. But <laughs> well, a lot of times <laughs> Do you think I... humor would have saved it? I think it would have. I think it would have made a difference. A lot of times, too, we laugh not because we think something is funny, but because we sympathize. Um, when somebody goes through a situation that we know, for, the, for example, the beginning of the movie Office Space, when the main character is in, he's sitting in traffic and it's, and it's just bumper to bumper and he sees the lane next to him is going so he he gets out of his lane and gets into that lane and as soon as he gets into the the next lane that lane stops and his lane starts going and it's not necessarily even we recognize that that is a painful situation but the reason we laugh is because that has happened to us and hey we're sympathizing with each other I suddenly that character becomes more human because that has been us before so we laugh <laughs> Uh, I work in an operating room. I'm a nurse anesthetist. And uh, I, if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter, I sometimes have vague, obviously no points of reference, but vague tweets about my job. And uh, in the operating room, under intense stress, you often have this kind of humor. And it also works very well in fiction. You know, So you'll have a very intense case where the patient is dying of cancer or something really awful, and you know the surgeon is taking a long time to close, and the circulator is like, don't bother, doctor, the wound has healed. It was something like that that just makes people laugh, and uh, you, you see that a lot in real life under intense stress. So if you can put that into your fiction, it really resonates with a lot of people. Um, another question I wanted to ask, um, ad lib versus scripted. That's and I didn't I didn't run this by you guys previously, so it wasn't in my previous notes. But um, I guess you have to add do you, this. <laughs> God, how do you how do you find that works best? Because I, if I script humor, it suddenly becomes not funny. But for the Dune Steve, they run little scripts all the time. Of, of, and Lauren, I don't know if you you guys don't script your humor. We I don't out, think we outline our our talking points and our questions, and then we just go. Uh -huh. Which is why editing is a nightmare. 
<laughs> do you think there's a right or a wrong? If you were giving advice to these guys about making uh, humor work for them, do you think that it's just your personality? I you... think there's a right and wrong for your podcast. For example, if I were to attempt to script something with the ladies' pen dragon, they would lose interest and just wouldn't want to do it because it would feel it would feel. We're not playing um, playing personas. We don't have personas on mm -hmm. our podcast. We are ourselves. So, uh, and much of our discussion is is based in our experiences, in our day jobs, uh, in our areas of study from university, and in our major interests in our lives. So, if we were to try to script the humor or script um, anything that wasn't just a, a, a one-off funny thing to do partway through the podcast. I don't think it would work very well because suddenly we would stop being authentic and if the humor is not organic in a discussion podcast, I think that would be a little bit difficult. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, um, for, for Big and Rich, since they are playing personas, maybe that's why the scripting works because you stay in character better? Well, I don't know. As far as advice goes, <clears throat> yeah, it's up to you what works for you. For us saying, hey, why don't you say something like, and then he says whatever he wants. It feels natural. It sounds more natural to you listeners. And, and I, we don't script a lot of things because it, I always feel like it sounds like somebody is reading, or at least when, when we're doing it. So yours are just outlines. They're not actually word for word. They're just well, sort of a like, say something like this. It's, just, it's harder to do that because I'm not going to tell him, okay, say it again, but just like this. Uh, it has to feel spontaneous, and if he can't get his mouth around it, mm -hmm. is it going to sound like something a person would really say? Oh, look at that guy. If he can't get his mouth around it, okay, that's going to be my post. <laughs> now, uh, that, there's going to be a lot of difference, though, if you're um, between um, a roundtable discussion podcast or a, um, where, like Big and Rish, have the discussions of the fiction they have just, uh, they've just uh, produced. During the actual piece of fiction, it is necessarily yes. Scripted. Scripted. Okay, so in my novels, when when the when, when I have to, write. but even then, I when I'm outlining for a novel, I don't, I'm not like, and then the character needs to be funny right here in this way. I'm usually writing dialogue, and the lines just come in exactly the same way they come in a conversation, mm -hmm. and I, that may be different from person to person. I don't know, but I, I do think it's an interesting question because I think there's a limit to how you how much you can script humor and have it work. Um, so the next one, uh, we as podcasters work with audio as much as with words, and I mean non-word non audio. Uh, what elements have you found that are specifically effective within the, audio, bleh, within the audio environment? I have some really funny clips to play here from both uh, Rish and Big. Um, let's see, I'll go ahead and play, I'll play the cockroach one you first. Want to can I say that up first? Uh, can you, would you like to talk about it first? <laughs> yes, okay, so I brought this in because we did a story called Open 24 Hours, and it took place on Earth a million years in the future, and, and the animals here had evolved so that they could talk, and, and Earth had become one big Walmart. And the guy comes, and, and the, 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 the guy that greets him at the Walmart, remember the Walmart greeters, is a cockroach that has evolved to, to talk. And, and so this is an example of just me reading the part with my regular voice, then doing a funny voice, Hopefully it makes it funnier. And then actually playing with the pitch of that funny voice. And hopefully that makes it funnier still. So you be the judge. A two meter tall blue, yellow, and green chitinous horror appeared, waving antennae and claws. Bokara screamed, backpedaling, snatching at his stunner. The monstrous insect drew itself up to full height, compound eyes glaring. Welcome to Earth Mart, it bellowed. Open 24 hours. Whoa, what? He stammered. Welcome to Earth Mart, where the customer is king. Open 24 hours for your shopping convenience. That's one. Two. A two meter tall blue, yellow, and green chitinous horror appeared, waving antennae and claws. Bokara screamed, backpedaling, snatching at his stunner. The monstrous insect drew itself up to its full height, compound eyes glaring. Welcome to Earth Mart! It bellowed. Open 24 hours! Whoa, what? He stammered. Welcome to Earth Mart! The insect repeated. Where the customer is king! Open 24 hours for your shopping convenience! 
A two meter tall blue, yellow, and green chitinous horror appeared, waving antennae and claws. Bokara screamed, backpedaling, snatching at his stunner. He lost his footing and the weapon. The monstrous insect drew itself up to its full height, compound eyes glaring. Welcome to Earthmart! It bellowed. Open 24 hours! <laughs> what? He stammered. Welcome to Earthmart! The insect repeated. Where the customer is king! Open 24 hours for your shopping convenience! There's another clip from that story that we were going to play too. Do I you not to want go to? Ahead. Oh, no, I want to. I just thought you might want to. So, so another tool. So we did a funny voice. Uh, there was also some music and acting and that the was added there at the end. Uh, but then the playing with the pitch. And then another thing that can make things funny is an accent. And later in the story, they encounter a cat, a tabby cat that has evolved a million years. And he's gotten really big and lazy, and I thought it would be funny to do it with an accent, funnier to do it with an accent. So I think we get just regular voice and then accent, and, and we play with the pitch as well. And part of what we're trying to show here is that it's the same story. It's the same writing. It was, it was a good story to begin with. It was a funny story to begin with, but it's, you giggle when you hear all the audio effects because you've got more tools uh, in an audio drama than you do just writing text on the page. So here's the cat. Behind the desk sat a large, ornate leather chair, its back to them. Slowly, it swung around to reveal its occupant. A tabby house cat the size of a small tiger. So, humans have finally remembered us, it said, though the yellow eyes held no friendliness. Disappeared to the stars you did, took the damn dogs with you, left us cats, as always, to mind the house. What? Bokara said. What did we cats get for this? You didn't even leave us any decent trees for scratching. You paved over half the oceans. Nice job, humans. And two. Behind the desk sat a large, ornate leather chair, its back to them. Slowly, it swung around to reveal its occupant. A tabby house cat the size of a small tiger. So, humans have finally remembered us, it said, though the yellow eyes held no friendliness. Disappeared to the stars, you did. Took the damn dogs with you. Left us cats as always to mind the house. What? Bokara said. What did we cats get for this? He didn't even leave us any decent trees for scratching. You paved over half the oceans. Nice job, humans. So obviously the acting there changed the feel of the story, even though it's exactly the same words. And you've got all those tools when you're doing audio, when you're doing an audio drama, so you might as well use them. And sometimes to, to piggyback off the, the information about accents, um, an accent can make a character suddenly recognizable as a another kind of trope and we can sometimes change those those tropes to fit into what we think of as uh, as a funnier character so whereas um, Rish was initially reading the cat just in a, in a very normal accent as soon as he started reading it in the accent of that familiar smarmy British gentleman we suddenly get a much clearer image of who that cat is through just that visual uh, a visualization of the cat through the audio um, or at least I did suddenly got a, yeah. a, a much clearer image of who, of who I thought that mm -hmm. cat was so sometimes utilizing those those tropes uh, that you imagine with accents can be a really powerful tool for character building or fleshing out a character even though you're sort of playing off a stereotype um, it does sometimes uh, really elevate the, the reading to a different level. And we'll talk a little bit about stereotypes at the end, see how much time we've got. Um, Rich, is there anything else you wanted to say about the, that particular no, no, clip? No, no, no. Okay. He's got another tool. That, okay. Yeah. He is uh, I am a tool, it turns <laughs> out. No, uh, yeah, definitely what, what Rich talked about is, is one of those things that's really good, being able to mess with voices and stuff we've done that a lot uh with our podcast we did just recently a christmas story 
And yeah, they, we did elf voices for these various characters. And then the producer went through, changed their voices up, you know, and, and then all of a sudden everybody's lines are much more humorous to listen to when they go from follow the yellow brick road to follow the yellow brick road, you know, it, it changes everything. Um, and other t uh, things that you can do sometimes to make your stuff funnier is uh, the use of sound effects um, can really help to add some humor sometimes. Uh, there's this story that we did once called Catastrophe Baker. Which Canticle one was it? For Catastrophe Baker and the Canticle for Leibowitz, which is a Mike Resnick story that uh, was, it's kind of a tall tale type story that uh, did set, he does all, a bunch of these where they're send ups of uh, science fiction classic ideas and, and stories. And uh, in this particular one, uh, Catastrophe Baker is just this monstrous guy that, you know, he, he's, he can beat up anybody, et cetera. And so he does so fairly often. And uh, when I was putting this story together, I'd read it through, and then I thought, you know, this could be a really good place to do some sound effects. So um, I'm going to read the passage that we have coming up, and then I'll play what it actually came out with, the sound effects. And you guys can decide if it makes it more funny uh, to add the sound effects in or not, I guess. I think it did. It cracked me up every time I put in the sound effects and then I listened to them through. Um, so here's, what, here's how it goes. Uh, Catastrophe Baker says, Howdy ma'am, I said, my name is Catastrophe Baker and you are the most beautiful thing I've seen during my long travels throughout the galaxy. Is this little twerp bothering you? Go away and leave us alone, snapped the little twerp. Well, that ain't no way to speak to a well-meaning stranger. So I knocked out eight of his teeth and busted three of his ribs and dislocated his left shoulder and kicked him in the groin as a mild reproof. And then I turned my attention back to the beautiful, if beleaguered, lady. You know, she said thoughtfully, you might be just what the doctor ordered. If I was the doctor, I'd be more concerned with helping your friend here, I said, giving him a friendly nudge with my toe to show there wasn't no hard feelings. I really and truly didn't mean to break his nose with it. So as you can see, it's pretty humorous to begin with, but now we add the sound effects in. Howdy, ma'am, I said. My name is Catastrophe Baker. And you are the most beautiful thing I've seen during my long travels throughout the galaxy. Is this little twerp bothering you? Go away and leave us alone, snapped the little twerp. Well, that ain't no way to speak to a well-meaning stranger. So I knocked out eight of his teeth and busted three of his ribs and dislocated his left shoulder and kicked him in the groin as a mild reproof. And then turned my attention back to the beautiful, if beleaguered, lady. You know... She said thoughtfully, You might be just what the doctor ordered. If I was the doctor, I'd be more concerned with helping your friend here, I said, giving him a friendly nudge with my toe to show there wasn't no hard feelings. Huh? I really and truly didn't mean to break his nose with it. <laughs> so you can see that there's definitely some added dimension to it and much more chuckles, I think, from it when you can add that kind of stuff to it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I had a great time even putting it together. It made it that much more fun even just to work on. Every time I'd play it back through to hear how it sounded, I couldn't help but laugh. And we all do full cast audio, which means that we have voice actors and music and sound effects. And that's kind of gone out of style in the last few years. You don't hear as much of it. The idea is that somehow sound effects make audio really, really cheesy. But as you can hear, like use correctly, they add a lot to it, and they can also make it hilarious. Um, so since we're talking about voice actors now, since I am talking about voice actors now, you have to come along. When directing voice actors, have you ever had difficulty getting them to deliver humorous lines properly? And how did you uh, coax them to make it work? Well, um, I'm, I'm lucky in that I have a pool of voice actors that I work with at home. Um, a group of, of friends that uh, come over and we all read the stories real time with each other. So it's really easy to be able to um, 
talk loudly over music. Um, so, yeah. Shh. I just fire mine when it doesn't work. So um, right. it's it's very easy. It's over. You get one chance it. with Abby. <laughs> one chance. And it's all over. I think better be funny. Before. But, um, but we're, we're lucky in that if, it's, if a line is not delivered correctly, um, sometimes different of us will have different ideas about how that line could be read. So, and sometimes the fastest way is just to give a line reading. You know, say it like this, put the emphasis here. But sometimes it's, it's nice to let the actors um, try it a couple times themselves and find what they think is funny because you never know what they're going to come up with and make funny that wasn't intended to be funny. Okay. What do you, what are you, and, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm asking a question that doesn't, I, I don't know if you've actually had voice actors before that didn't understand that something was supposed to be funny. Um, there's, I'm sure, been a time or two, and uh, I have at times, I and mean, there's been a time or two where we've actually had to write somebody back and say, can you turn that music down? Please. We're trying to be funny. <laughs> this is a funeral in here. Come on. <laughs> Wow. Then there's unintentional funny, like your, for example, background music you didn't expect. Uh, but yeah, there have been a few times where we've had to actually write somebody back and say, hey, uh, can you give us another shot? And we'll just give them a description of how we want it. And then there's been other times where it's just too difficult to give a description of how you want it. It's, it's nice to not have to say, I want you to say it exactly like this. Here, do that you know, turn them into a puppet kind of a thing when, you know, actors usually don't appreciate that. Um, and maybe some of the people we work with aren't actually actors. They're just folks that are podcasters and they're kind of learning their way through it. And so they might appreciate it. Others are just like, Pfft. My, my most frequent correction for humor is say it with a smile on your face because people can hear a smile in your voice. And if you're trying, if the character is delivering a cutting line that's intended to be funny, which I have a lot of those, if you say it with a smile, it completely changes the way it sounds. It does. Uh, and the way it's, it's taken. That's yep. probably my most frequent retake for not funny enough. We've had to do retakes of that when we have bad outtakes <laughs> and we can't stop laughing. Then we start yes. into the narration. It's like, no, 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 no go back and start over and stop smiling okay yeah it's supposed to be humorous you know, the funeral i've had the opposite happen where someone they thought something was funny and they made a line funny that i never realized was supposed to be funny or everybody has their own sense of humor and you give it to them and say do what you will with it and maybe they do a voice or maybe they're they're in doing an impersonation of their uncle as somebody that I don't know, but it's funnier because they brought a part of themselves to it. And Renee did a, a reading of a story that people just thought was hilarious, and it wasn't meant to be a funny story. <laughs> but, it, but people liked it because it made them laugh, and so I, well, that was a success. Whereas I didn't intend for people to think it was as funny as it was, so I, I thank her for that, you know? And sometimes you have it happen where you have to actually dial back the funny um, to make it fit with the tone of the story. Um, I did auditions um, a few months ago for a, for a role in a, uh, in a short fiction piece that I um, am working on podcasting right now. And uh, I had a, I had a, it was an open, open season on accents, any accent you want to do that you think would fit this main character. And I had um, a Jay Langelis, Langlis, I don't know how you pronounce his last name, but he's a fantastic voice actor. And he came back with a series of accents, and his favorite one was this very over-the-top, dramatic Scottish accent. And it was hilarious, but it was just, it was too funny. And uh, it didn't quite fit with the tone, so we ended up having to go with something that was a little bit, that was dialed back from that. So, kind of in keeping with that, um, Harder kind of uh, question. Um, I'm personally <laughs> now we've driven everyone away. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> now we can get to the now we can get to the offensive parts. There's no Yay. one left to offend. Uh, I have personally found that humor can be used to break down stereotypes. Uh, if a black character or a gay character or a woman, a uh, Republican, a Democrat, uh, butlers, <laughs> children, <laughs> dogs, cats. Um, if those characters uh, make somebody laugh, then the character is suddenly identified for their humor. 
um, used correctly, this can take the spotlight off their minority status. Suddenly they become someone that you can identify with, they share a sense of humor with you. Um, it can be a way to, uh, to make that minority character relatable. Um, in, a, in a similar vein, you can sometimes present ideas with humor that the audience uh, would, would not otherwise uh, tolerate, but they'll listen to you if you're funny. People will listen to almost anything if you are funny enough. Um, this can backfire. Obviously, you don't want people laughing at the character because of their minority status. That's generally offensive. So usually you want kinds of humor that, uh, that would be shared with your wider audience um, that are not specific to the minority status. But sometimes people get away with, with making uh, audiences laugh at, at a minority status and, and are still humanizing the character. So it's a, really, it's a really touchy subject. Accents fall under that umbrella where like a posh British accent is hilarious to us, but it might be offensive to someone whose grandmother talks like that. They're like, what's so funny about that? So, and you're, you're never going to please everyone. You're probably always going to offend someone if you're being really funny. But uh, what do you guys think about that? How have you handled that? What have you come up against? We, um, we rehearsed this last night, and we, uh, <laughs> we were completely offensive and pretty funny, but I knew once we got in front of an audience, people were going to be like, mm, done talking. Okay, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start it off. I lived for three years in Japan, and I taught English during that time. And my second year in Japan was during um, the American election. Ah. <laughs> ah. So, um, it, English is characterized by changing around the L's and the R's, or changing all <laughs> L's to R's. So you might understand why when I was sitting in a booth with a Japanese businessman standing there very, very calmly asking me about what I would call the election, <laughs> it was funny. Now, there used to be a segment on a radio show as I was driving to work with, uh, my dad used to take me to, um, to high school on his way to work, and there was a, um, a, a really hilarious segment that, was, that revolved around somebody saying, the answer is supplies. And then you have to try to guess what the joke is. And once they said the joke was, what does a Chinese man shout when he's jumping out from behind furniture at a party? And things like that where it's like, oh, ha, that's funny, but it's also really offensive. Remind me never to speak to you again. But it's still funny because partly it's true. <laughs> and I, I, ta I taught in uh, Taiwan for a year, so I also got the, the entertainment of having my students who were trying very hard to, you know, to have correct English um, say they were going to their, you know, my correct housewives say that we need to shit down. Yes. Because that is, you know, they confuse the SH and the H sounds, just yeah. as the, the Japanese confuse the L and the R. And incorrect um, English is often funny. Uh, David Sedaris, a very popular uh, comedian from North Carolina, uh, where I am from, has a t an entire book called Me Talk Pretty One Day. And part of the, the funniest excerpt from that was when he was talking about living in France when he and all of the other students who were all international from other places sat down and were trying to explain Easter to a Moroccan student who didn't understand what it was and they were speaking terrible French and he was translating the French exactly as they were saying it like Jesus he die one day go up above my head for to be with your father they put him upon two morsels of lumber and like translating exactly as they were saying and that can be hilarious but, um, but you're going to offend someone. Uh, offend and, and often the things that we laugh hardest at do offend someone. So you kind of have to pick your battles. Uh, and, and, and like I said, this is, this is not going to be completely clean. Uh, our podcasts are rated explicit on iTunes. Um, what about you? Have you guys ever actually offended some I My funniest character in my podcast. <laughs> I'll say for my funniest my, list here. my funniest character in my podcast is gay. And he's not funny because he's gay. He's funny because he has a biting wit. And that's what people enjoy. But I also get uh, I get weekly, not daily, but I don't know, every few days, I get these really conflicted fan mails that are essentially angry at me for making them empathize with this character that they think is essentially 
I don't know, dirty a or something. Human being. A sinful human being. A sinful um, shell. So you, you, you can't win, um, but uh, sometimes you can screw up worse than other times. <laughs> So, moving on to Big and Rich. <laughs> well, it, 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 she made a good point. You'll always offend someone, um, even if you don't mean to. And, and I'm a big believer in your intentions. Are, I, I hate it when people say that hell is pa- you know, paved with... Good intentions. Yeah, it was something about Mars bars. And yes, good intentions. Because it's just like, well, if you're going to be judged on anything, why not be judged on your intentions? It's like, you know, okay, you know, there was a car accident, but I was trying to help get to the birthday party. Or I, I don't know what people would have car accidents for. Uh, so, so lots of times when we have offended people with our attempts to be funny, we didn't realize that something could be taken a, a different way. Or, or that you can't see our faces while we're recording something and you don't know that it's tongue in cheek or you don't know that we're not being serious or it's a character or that there's another way to take that word. Um, and, 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 you know, it really frustrates me when I am judged, when we are judged for something that, that hey, that wasn't us. I mean, it was us, but it wasn't what, what you're saying we said. Okay, we said what you said we said, but we didn't say it the, okay, we said it the way that you say that we said it, but the way that we said it was not the way that you heard it. And I don't know how you do, how you fix that. Maybe it's better to not try to amuse everybody, but if you make eight of the people laugh and two people get up and leave, you were still funny, right? You were still successful. I, I guess maybe that's a line you have to draw yourself. Well, is it worth alienating those two people to make the other eight laugh because we talked about bonding your audience and those eight will bond to you harder probably than if you had told a a kind of safe joke a joke that everyone including the two-year-old kid could laugh at i mean if if you tell jokes that are a little bit edgy the people who laugh tend to bond to you tighter and harder than if you tell completely safe jokes all the time well, it's there's. I think there's a there's a comedian out there who does um, a song called "Everyone's a Little Bit Racist," and a lot. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that song. Yeah, and it is everyone's the funniest song because racist. everyone's like, "We're not. Ra- I'm not rich." Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, if you put it that way, racist as long as it's not about you. Sorry. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think it's it's important to if if you are really reaching to to maintain that kind of close bond with an audience it's just like not everyone if you it's like taking risks if you don't take risks are you going to get as much out of it as if you did take the risk maybe not um so sometimes often what is the most reaction provoking is the stuff that is the best because it does just because it does provoke that reaction because it means that people are listening and that people are responding whether that response is positive or negative it's still a response it's made ripples and made people think about something even if that's just to think that you're an (laughs) a-hole well sometimes like you guys rich will sometimes play a racist character on their podcast and he will be intentionally ridiculous as a racist and, and if you you know if you take that wrong and you think he's serious then then you're very offended, but he's making fun of people that are this way. Um, sarcasm is tough. Sarcasm is tough. I, I wanted to say, when you're talking about stereotypes, I think the most important thing is if your audience gets a sense that you have compassion, even for people that you are making fun of, even for people that don't agree with you, if that somehow comes through at the beginning, beginning or the end or the middle at some point, then I, I think that that goes a long way towards uh, allowing people to laugh at themselves, allowing people to laugh at each other uh, without feeling like you're, you're, pu- you're putting them in a corner and creating an us and them sort of a situation, which is what you don't want to do with and, uh, stereotypes and humor. And maybe knowing your audience might help too. Mm-hmm. Know what they value most and maybe try not to attack that one thing. <laughs> like cats. Right. <laughs> if, if it turns out your entire audience is made up of the crazy old cat ladies, then you shouldn't. Oh, what? I am offended by that. <laughs> Why do cat ladies always have to be crazy? Oh, always crazy. <laughs> crazy okay. young cat ladies. I will accept that. Okay. But yeah, I mean, maybe that's not the thing that you want to uh, go t- over the line with. Um, 
also sometimes, and especially in the podcasts where you have um, people who banter back and forth that know each other very well, um, such as you two, sometimes what you think is funny and what you know about the other person can cause you to be more relaxed or say something in a way that you know the other person yeah. understands it's sarcasm coming from you, but maybe a first time listener to the podcast coming in and not knowing necessarily anything about you will hear that and won't won't hear the sarcasm. <laughs> and I mean, just yesterday we were all walking around together and they kept making comments and I kept taking them seriously when everybody else would laugh and I would just keep barreling on with my explanations and he would say, stop taking me seriously. I mean, it's that kind of thing where you don't, you don't necessarily, you might have to get to know somebody first before it becomes humorous. So sometimes people will be offended and walk away without giving it a chance because you don't know that person very well, which I guess you can maybe try to it's a uh, work with and put those flags in for those new listeners. But. It is important to kind of warn people if, if your stuff might be edgy. Sometimes they respond better with a warning. So at the beginning of my <laughs> podcast, I say, um, if you have to ask whether you will be offended, you probably will. And I say it with a smile in my voice. And I, you know, if, if they come back and say I was offended, you're like, well, it, every single episode had this at the beginning. <laughs> like I said, um, I think I'm about done. Do you guys have anything to add? Do you guys have any questions? Were you offended? <laughs> we did our job. Send hate mail to <laughs> doomsteve at editor.com. <laughs> you, you want your listeners to like you. People want other people to like them. But somebody's not going to respond to, hey, you, sir, with the blue shirt. I, I, I like you. You remind me of somebody that I can. can will, you be my, will you be my grandfather? Because he's not here anymore. <laughs> People don't respond to that. You can't ask somebody to be your friend. But if you make them laugh or whatever, or you say, hey, I don't care if that guy likes me or not, you know, or, or, and, and then he smiles and he's like, well, you know what? Despite myself, I do like that guy. Then you win. And, and it's, a, it's a tool or it's a shortcut or maybe it's more socially acceptable to make a joke and, and get Lauren to laugh. You know, rather than, you know, it's like, hey, how you? I find you attractive or, well, you know, whatever the deal is kind of thing. It's just there, there are certain things that work on certain people that won't work on that, that where a more direct approach or being sincere or being needy, which I certainly am, uh, that, that doesn't work. You don't want to know that somebody's just like, Hey, I, I don't have a lot of friends with blonde hair. Um, so could I have some, you know, that's just, <laughs> you don't want the desperation to show through in your eyes. <laughs> And you don't Even want them to ever smell your we're food. We're all desperate attention whores. That's why we podcast. <laughs> okay. I podcast I because I don't have a face for YouTube. <laughs> all right. I could say some... Are we going to end on that note? Because... <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> it's not your face they'll be looking at, my dear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, not... if, but if you make people laugh and they, they come back to your YouTube page over the other person who does have a face for YouTube, no? I mean, that's a trick. That's a, that's yeah. a skill. That's a talent you have that she doesn't have. Yes. There what you go. talent? I wasn't paying attention. Okay, so there was our panel. I uh, hope you liked it. If anybody's listened to it, the audience for the panel is now doubled. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, we didn't mention the the crowd. Holy cow! I mean, there there people were were lining, people were clamoring to get away from our panel, <laughs> and uh, I, I that didn't entirely bum me out because hey, I still had a microphone in front of me, and so I could perform and be wacky, and uh, and I sort of thrive on that. But when it was over, I was like, oh, well, you know, that was cool. But not many people saw this performance. But then... Now we're sending it out to them all. Yeah, all I the guess people so the that people. missed it, I guess, right? Gives us finally the audience that we didn't have in the uh, auditorium. Right. And then the, the guy that arranged it and invited Abby, who invited us there thought that we did a fine job or, or that's maybe that's what he always says but <laughs> well he did say he wanted us to come back 
He said he wanted to have more rooms for the uh, fiction podcasting. He said he wanted us to do actual like performances, like readings, where we did like a story live on stage for like the first half hour of the panel. And then the second half hour, we had like a question and answer session where we talked about what we did. And people said, oh, why did you do that? Because that sucked and stuff. Th- this was Marshall Latham that wanted these things, not not this guy. No. What the guy said specifically is Jay that he wanted to see... Ravenscraft. Scott Sigler in his underwear. And... <laughs> but yeah, he's having us back. He, well, at least he said he was going to have us back. I guess we'll find out months from now if, he, if that's actual an invitation. But keep he, it marked on your calendar because there should be... I, I think there's going to be a bigger fiction podcast presence next year. So it might be worth actually traveling out to and checking out... Yeah, and if there's a bunch of people, I know this is a year away, but if there's a bunch of people that say they're going to come and do karaoke with us, uh, we'll try and give everybody parts in this whatever story. Yeah, there you go. We can have one heck of a big reading with all folks uh, hanging around. We'll have to get a bigger hotel room. Now we wouldn't have to do that. More more mics is all we need. We'll have to have Abby get a bigger hotel room. Yeah, there you go. All right, so hope you enjoyed the panels, and uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty much, I mean, I don't know what order our, our releases are being released on, but that's the last thing I have for you. I think we may still have a That Gets My Goat. We got a gigantic two-hour episode of That Gets My Goat. And that will come out after this? Will we we'll likely be after this, but perhaps not. I'm not sure, but uh, as far as us recording it this is the last thing we're doing on the new media yeah let's Expo. not talk about it ever again. we're not doing any more uh stuff except for maybe mentioning it in a regular episode that you should come over here and check it out yeah nine months from now we will have to deal with the aftermath of the new media expo but nothing else there you go so thanks for listening and see you later folks good night That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license.